this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this week's video. On this week's video, we're in session 3B <laughs> of our new series entitled The QME Clinical Rounds. And the reason I say that we're in session 3B is because we're in session 3 of this program related to shoulder tendinopathy and permanent impairments related to shoulder tendinopathy. And because of the scope of the problem and the amount of material that we have to discuss, it's taking more than one session to handle the topic of shoulder tendinopathy. So today we're in session number two of our session related to shoulder tendinopathy. And before we get into today's discussion, let's just review uh, the philosophy of this program. And that has to do with common clinical conditions that you're gonna encounter in your career as a qualified medical evaluator. In this series, we're talking about orthopedic conditions that seem to plague injured workers in the California workers' compensation system. And as a result, these injured workers are gonna be face-to-face -face with you in the qualified medical evaluation. And I'm sharing with you some of the nuances and important uh, considerations related to these common orthopedic conditions that will allow you to quickly and accurately arrive at the correct and accurate conclusions and uh, determinations in each of your cases. So in session number one of this program, we talked about uh, a very common clinical condition that confronts qualified medical evaluators, and that is the condition of industrially caused or industrially related carpal tunnel syndrome. And we talked about the pathognomonic finding in carpal tunnel syndrome, the most reliable and pathognomonic of all physical examination findings and all clinical observations. And that was the so-called flick sign, the flick sign. So that was a fascinating discussion. And I hope you took the message of that discussion to heart uh, and sharpen your observation skills of your examinee in the face-to-face -face evaluation to detect the presence or the absence of a flick sign with your examinee. If your examinee actually does not present with a flick sign or does not demonstrate to you a flick sign at some point during the extended time that you and the examinee have together, there's a very, very high likelihood a 93% chance that the examinee is not suffering from a bona fide carpal tunnel syndrome. On the other hand, if the examinee does demonstrate to you a bona fide flick sign, there's a very, very high percentage probability that the examinee is in fact suffering from a bona fide active and symptomatic carpal tunnel syndrome. So that was a fascinating and very useful uh, discussion for us as qualified medical evaluators. In session number two of this program, we talked about uh, common clinical finding uh, related to back injuries and back pain examinees. And that was the clinical and diagnostic imaging finding of Schmorl's nodes, Schmorl's nodes. Now I know that you've uh, learned about Schmorl's nodes uh, a thousand times uh, in your clinical training and you've probably been to uh, continuing education seminars where uh, the imaging findings of Schmorl's nodes have been discussed, and you're well aware of Schmorl's nodes. However, it's important for us as qualified medical evaluators to reacquaint ourselves and sharpen our diagnostic imaging skills to detect Schmorl's nodes when they are present. When they are present. And there's two types of Schmorl's nodes. There's asymptomatic Schmorl's nodes, and there are symptomatic Schmorl's nodes. And it's going to be up to you as the qualified medical evaluator to make a determination as to whether your examinee's Schmorl's nodes are symptomatic or are asymptomatic, or whether those Schmorl's nodes were caused by the industrial injury, or whether the Schmorl's nodes were exacerbated and or aggravated by the industrial injury. In other words, there are many considerations that you as a qualified medical evaluator are gonna be responsible for making uh, when you discover and detect that your examinee has the clinical finding of Schmorl's nodes. So that was a fascinating discussion.
And Schmorl's nodes in and of themselves are fascinating clinical findings because a Schmorl's node indicates a fracture of the vertebrae. So imagine this, you have a ball bearing of the nucleus pulposus within the intervertebral disc, okay? So the nucleus pulposus sits between the vertebral end plates of the vertebrae above and the vertebrae below. And when you have a Schmorl's node, the nucleus pulposus can fracture and herniate through either the superior vertebral end plate or the inferior vertebral end plate, or the nucleus pulposus can herniate through and fracture both vertebral end plates. So imagine these vertebrae coming together, being squished and compressed together with the nucleus pulposus herniating superiorward, creating a defect in the vertebrae above, and herniating inferior and creating a defect in the vertebrae below. This represents a significant spinal injury that can leave the examinee with significant permanent impairment rating. So that was a fascinating discussion. And now we're in session number three of our new program. And we're talking about rotator cuff tendinopathy. And with regards to shoulder and rotator cuff tendinopathy, we have at least three considerations that we're handling in this discussion. And in session number one, we talked about the scope of the problem. The scope of the shoulder pain problem, both within the general population and then also within the industrial setting with regards to the injured workers that we see face to face in the QME evaluation. So just a couple of statistics to refresh our memory. We went over a couple of studies in that uh, session and we learned that shoulder pain affects up to two thirds of the adult population at some point in a person's lifespan. And you may be able to relate to this. Uh, even today, as we speak during the course of today's discussion, you may uh, yourself have some degree of shoulder soreness, shoulder pain, or other shoulder symptom, similar to the injured workers that you evaluate. And then we went over a 2012 uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics study, which tells us that annually, on an annual basis, and these are 2012 statistics, so uh, they may or may not be exactly identical today, but we can use this as a general benchmark uh, for the incidence of shoulder pain in the industrial setting. This study told us that there was uh, over 1.1 million cases of shoulder injuries reported across the United States in one annual work year, which was 2012 which resulted in approximately 41 and a half thousand lost work years due to injured workers being out on total temporary disability and being away from the workplace. So this represents a huge, huge loss of productivity simply due to this one condition. Well, in today's discussion, we're gonna continue with uh, shoulder tendinopathy considerations and we're gonna talk about the pathoanatomic changes that take place within shoulder tendons that allow them to become persistently and chronically painful and that allow them to create chronic and persistent uh, loss of function for activities of daily living and that then go on to cause the examinee permanent impairment as these conditions fail, fail to be able to recover to a pre-injury condition. And then once we handle that discussion, I wanna share with you uh, some options that you have available to you for rating these examinees for permanent impairment when you are confronted with examinees who are diagnosed and who have bona fide and active symptomatic rotator cuff tendinopathy at the permanent and stationary evaluation want to share with you uh, how you can rate these examinees and how you can provide for an accurate permanent impairment rating for these conditions that will never ever uh, recover and will never get well. Okay, so with that as our introduction, let's begin today's discussion uh, in session number two on rotator cuff tendinopathy. And today we're considering the pathoanatomic uh, 
consideration. Okay, so let's begin. And in order to understand what happens and what takes place inside tendons when tendons become painful and degenerative, it's important for us to understand the basic anatomy of a tendon. So let's uh, briefly review uh, the anatomy of tendons and we'll discuss both normal tendons and then we'll discuss and contrast normal tendons with degenerative and painful tendons. And in order to understand the anatomy of tendons, it's important that we go all the way back to your training, uh, either in osteopathic school, medical school, chiropractic school, podiatry school, etc. And I want to shake a couple of synapses loose <laughs> from those deep vaults of your brain and remind you of your training in anatomy related to the muscular system. Remember the, your training in the muscular system? If your anatomy training was anything like mine, the anatomy of the body was divided up into many, many systems and regions, one of which was the muscular system. So in uh, learning about the muscular system, uh, if your training was anything like mine, we first began with a diagram similar to the following where we learned some of the landmarks and basic components of skeletal muscle. And then we got out the microscope and then we went down deep into the histology of muscle tissue and we got into the actin and myosin filaments and the contractile elements of the sarcomeres of skeletal muscle. And then once we had a handle on that, we then had to learn all the names and all the origins and all the insertions of every single muscle. <laughs> in the body. Does that sound familiar to you? That's how my training on the muscular system went and likely it went uh, about same or similar for you. So I'm going to take you all the way back 25, 35, 45 years ago to the muscular system and jog your memory about what it is that we're dealing with when we deal with painful and degenerative tendons. So what we have here is a cross section of a skeletal muscle, and this could be any muscle in the body. And here it is attaching to a bone, and this could be any bone in the body. So we could be talking about your biceps muscle attaching onto your radius bone. This could be a tricep muscle uh, attaching onto the olecranon process of the ulna. This could be the gastrocnemius with the Achilles tendon here attaching onto the calcaneus bone, okay? So this is a representative skeletal muscle, okay? And all skeletal muscle of the body has some common features uh, shared uh, regardless of where the skeletal muscle is located in the body. So here is a cross section of a whole muscle. If we look at the whole muscle in cross section, we see that the whole muscle is divided into subgroups. And those subgroups are called fascicles fascicles. So here's a fascicle. Here's another fascicle contained here. Here's a fascicle here. So these fascicles are individual bundles that are contained within the larger structure, which is the whole muscle. And there's many, many fascicles uh, contained within the whole muscle. Well, if we break out the fascicle even further, we find that the fascicle is where the individual skeletal muscle cells are located. And individual skeletal muscle cells, you'll remember, are elongated and are multinucleated cells. They're unique types of cells that make them uh, ideally suited to their unique function, which is for contraction, okay? So here's a diagram here of a single muscle cell. Muscle cells are elongated cells, so they're referred to as muscle fibers. One single muscle fiber <clears throat> represents one single muscle cell. And there are many, many, many muscle fibers contained within the fascicle. And then the muscle fiber itself, which is a single cell, has organelles within it that are the contractile elements, which are actin filaments, myofilaments. And you'll remember that those are arranged in repeating uh, units known as the sarcomeres. And then uh, the sarcomere is the contractile element uh, of the muscle, which allows the muscle to do what it does, which is shorten and lengthen, okay? Well, 
each individual muscle fiber cell, like every cell in your body, is surrounded by a cell membrane. Cell membrane. Cell membrane is generally referred to as the plasma membrane, but in muscle cells, we give it a unique name and it's known as the sarcolemma. Okay, so many of the terms and terminologies that we use related to muscle cells have the prefix sarco, sarco, such as sarcolemma and sarcomeres and sarcoplasm, which refers to the cytoplasm of muscle cells. So here's a muscle fiber, and the muscle fiber, of course, is surrounded by a cell membrane, which is known as the sarcolemma. So as you trace this muscle fiber down the length of the skeletal muscle here, such as your bicep muscle, realize that it's covered in, along its length with sarcolemma. Now, the sarcolemma and each individual muscle fiber, in addition to uh, the sarcolemma, is surrounded by connective tissue known as the endomesium. So each of these muscle fibers here are surrounded by endomesium. And the endomesium, like the sarcolemma, traverses and travels the length of the fascicle, travels the length of the fascicle. So we have these individual muscle fibers, these elongated fibers being covered by connective tissue that travels along the length of the fiber and travels along the length of the fascicle. Well, each of the fascicles themselves are covered by another connective tissue layer known as the perimesium. So here's all the fascicles and those are being surrounded by another connective tissue layer. Connective tissue meaning collagen fibers, okay? So each of these fascicles are surrounded by connective tissue, which then travels the length of the muscle and becomes contiguous down here and continues past the point at which the muscle, fi uh, muscle fibers terminate. And this point is known as the musculotendinous junction. But the connective tissue layering, the perimesium, around the fascicles and the endomesium around the individual muscle fibers continues past the musculotendinous junction to become the tendon. And then finally, the entire bundle of the muscle, of the whole muscle, is covered by another connective tissue layer known as the epimesium. And the epimesium, like the perimesium below it and the endomesium below it, continue along beyond the whole muscle and continue and become the tendon. These connective tissue layers that are found up in the muscle continue down below the muscle as tendon and continue along as the connective tissue bundles of the tendon. We're gonna investigate the, the bundles within the tendon structure as well. And the connective tissue layers here then become continuous with the periosteum of the bone. And then the inner layers of the perimesium and the endomesium penetrate the bone. And as we're gonna see, those penetrations into the bone create a continuity of tendon with bone such that the tendon becomes integrated and almost inseparable from the bone. So here is the musculotendinous junction and this is known as the osteotendinous junction. Okay, so now let's dissect this section right here of the tendon and take a look at its uh, anatomy and its histology. Okay, so here we are now. We're down into uh, the cross section of the tendon and we're gonna be out here in this section of the tendon this is the rotator cuff tendons now. And we're considering uh, the intratendinous substance as the tendon approaches the osteotendinous junction. So that's the cross section that we have here. So we're gonna see that those same connective tissue layers that we found in muscle, which was going from external to internal was the endomesium, I'm sorry, the epimesium the perimesium and the endomesium, those connective tissues continue down into the tendon and, be, and become uh, 
the component elements, the, the components of the tendon. Now down in the tendon, those connective tissues change their name. So the epimysium becomes continuous with the epitenon, the epitenon, and that's this connective tissue layer here that surrounds the entirety of the tendon. And then both the perimysium, which surrounds each of the muscular fascicles, and the endomysium, which surrounds each of the individual muscle fibers, those become renamed, renamed as the endotenon. And the endotenon uh, lines circumferentially, circumferentially surrounds the tertiary fiber tendon bundles, the secondary fiber bundles, and then also the primary fiber bundles. Now, the tendon cells, the tenocytes, are located here in the secondary fiber bundles. And it's the tenocytes that are going to maintain the health and the homeostasis of the tendon. And as we're going to see with degenerative tendinopathy, there's some upset in the homeostasis of the tendon, either due to excessive loading or excess repetitious loading, or in other words, there's some upset that upsets the homeostasis of the tendon, and that's registered in the tenocyte tendon cells, which maintain the collagen fibers that then emanate from each of these primary fiber bundles that maintain the extracellular matrix, which you can see here dotted in between each of the uh, primary fiber bundles here in the secondary fascicle, or in the tertiary fascicle here. And all of this structure is maintained by the tenocytes, which are found here uh, within the secondary fiber bundle. And then the uh, output product of the tenocytes is nothing more than collagen fibrils. Collagen fibrils. Collagen fibrils are protein products that are produced by the tenocyte cells through the process of transcription and translation, if you can remember those back from uh, biology. And those fibrils are assembled into uh, larger collagen fibers. And then here, we have out here, our attachment uh, to bone. And we're gonna investigate uh, the attachment of tendon to bone at the osteotendinous junction here in just a minute. But I want you to just take a look at this cross-sectional anatomy of tendons and isn't it fascinating? These are extremely strong structures made of dense, regular fibrous connective tissue, which is uh, type uh, one collagen fibers, very tightly packed in linear, linearly arranged collagen fibers that create stiffness within this structure, stiffness which is resistance to stretch, which allows the muscles to transfer the force of muscle contraction efficiently to bone this is the transfer element here, the tendon, allows the transfer of muscular forces into bone to allow movements. Okay, so how is this accomplished? This is accomplished out at the myo, uh, I'm sorry, at the osteotendinous junction. <coughs> so we're investigating these areas here in the rotator cuff where the tendon now attaches into the bone, which is the head of the humerus at either the superior, uh, I'm sorry, the um, greater or the lesser tubercles of the humerus bone. So the primary bundle, the secondary bundle, and the tertiary bundles are surrounded by a sheath of connective tissue known as the endotenon. And as we said, the endotenon is contiguous with both the perimysium and the endomysium of the muscle. So these connective tissues facilitate the gliding of bundles against one another during tendon movement. And as we're going to see, any disruption in gliding can create internal shear forces which in itself can upset the homeostasis of the tendon and lead to degeneration of the tendon. Now the endotenon is then contiguous with the epitenon here. The fine layer of connective tissue that sheaths the tendon unit. So all of these connective tissues are contigu contiguous one with another and they're all going to allow the blending of this tendon into
the osteotendinous junction. Finally, uh, lying outside the epitenon and contiguous with it is a loose elastic, elastic connected tissue layer known as the peritenon, which allows the tendon to move against neighboring tissues. And then all of these connective tissues, all of these uh, connective tissue layers are attached to the bone by collagenous fibers referred to as Sharpie fibers <coughs> that continue into the matrix of the bone. So let's take a look at these Sharpie fiber attachments of tendon to bone. Okay, so down at the osteotendinous junction, we're going to see the attachment and the integration of tendinous collagen fibers with bone collagen fibers. And here, I told you I was going to take you back to your anatomy training. We're now switching systems from the muscular system into the skeletal system. And if you remember back to your anatomy training, you remember we had these models uh, in lab that look like this that represent a cross section of the bone. Do you remember these types of models here that showed us that the functional unit of bone was this circular structure and those were uh, referred to as the osteons. Remember the osteons? And the osteons contained uh, the nucleated osteocyte cells here represented by these dark circles. Those are the bone forming cells known as the osteocytes. And then uh, we had these canals that's uh, separated down through the center uh, of these osteons. And we had all of these interconnecting herversion canals within this uh, cross-sectional structure of bone. And the bone set up these circumferential layers known as lamellae. You remember the lamellae? So here's a diagram of the lamellae here. These are layers and layers of lamellae. And the lamellae are very similar to uh, the tendinous extracellular matrix. And bone and tendon have very, very similar uh, histology. They're both connective tissues. They both arrive from the embryonic mesochyme and they both share the same basic structural format in that they both contain cells, they both contain fibers, and they both contain some form, some consistency of extracellular matrix. Now in tendons, the cells are tenocytes, whereas in bones, the cells are osteocytes. In tendons, the extracellular matrix is uh, both gelatinous and liquid. It's made of water and proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans, whereas in bone, the extracellular matrix, as depicted here, is calcified, is calcified and is hardened. And then finally, uh, but they both have extracellular matrix, just of a different consistency. And then uh, both bone and uh, tendon because they uh, are both connective tissues, also have some type and consistency of fibers. And this is the basic uh, format of all the connective tissues of the body. There's cells, there's fibers, and there's some type of extracellular matrix. Well, in bone, the fibers that we're talking about are collagen fibers. In tendon, the fibers that we're talking about are collagen fibers. So down at the osteotendinous junction, the collagen fibrils and the collagen fibers from the tendon blend into and penetrate the lamellae of the bone as depicted here. This is the osteotendinous junction here. And these collagen fibers from the tendon penetrate the bone and become contiguous and continuous with the collagen fibers of the bone. Isn't that amazing? There's almost no discernible transition between the collagen fibers of the tendon and the collagen fibers of the bone. They, they become contiguous and interdigitated and continuous with the collagen fibers in the bone. And where these connections take place, we refer to these as the Sharpie fiber uh, attachments or the Sharpie fiber connections of the uh, tendon to the bone at the osteotendinous junction. So this is a very tight uh, and very secure and very solid 
uh, junctional transitional interface between the tendon and the bone. Well, everything goes along well and good with these tendons until there's some upset in the internal homeostasis of the tendon. And this internal upset in the homeostasis of the tendon is registered in the tendon cells, the tenocytes. And when there is uh, an upset in the tenocyte homeostasis, the tenocytes then fail to function properly and the output products of the tenocyte cells, which are the collagen fibers and the extracellular matrix, the environment that is maintained ordinarily by the tenocytes begins to deteriorate. And the upset in the internal homeostasis uh, of a tendon comes about through what is referred to in the literature as abnormal loading, abnormal loading. So tendons can be subject to two kinds of loads. They can be subjected to normal loads and they can be subjected to abnormal loads. Now in the presence of normal loading of tendons, tendons like muscle undergo an anabolic response and they get stronger, they get thicker, and they get stiffer, meaning more resistance, more resistant to stretch. In other words, they fortify themselves in the presence of proper loading. And that's the purpose of physical therapy. When examinees or patients come to the physical therapist with a problem related to the tendons, the skill and expertise of the therapist is to be able to provide and introduce proper loads, proper loads. Proper loads on tendons will create a stronger fortified tendon, it creates an anabolic response within the tendon. Improper loads, excessive loads, abnormal loads, such as what are commonly encountered in the workplace, do just the opposite and cause tendons to degenerate and become uh, painful. So in the literature, there are described uh, three different types of abnormal loads that tendons can be uh, exposed to. There is excessive and or abnormal tensile loading. Tensile loading is linear loading along the line uh, of the collagen fibers. There is abnormal uh, compression loading. And I'll give you an example of uh, compression loading in a minute. And then there is abnormal shearing loading that the tendon uh, fascicles and primary, secondary, and tertiary bundles can be subjected to, which can uh, also upset the internal homeostasis. Uh, of the tendon cells. So let's uh, go through each of these one by one. Okay, so the first type of abnormal loading that tendons can be subjected to is tensile loading. Tensile loading is load uh, applied along the length, linearly along the length of the tendon. Tensile loading is loading that attempts to stretch or elongate uh, an otherwise uh, stiff tendon. So tensile loading becomes abnormal when it involves either repeated or unaccustomed, unaccustomed end range strain. And when we refer to end range, we're talking about the end range uh, of the joint involved that the tendon crosses. So imagine uh, a person who uh, begins a running program and wants to get in shape very quickly. And so they decide to do uh, some hill sprints and they're running uphill with the Achilles tendon in strong dorsiflexion at the end range of motion. And then they're repeatedly running up, uh, running up this hill when it's not something that the tendons have become accustomed to or have been trained for. So this is the type of uh, repetitive or unaccustomed loading, particularly at the end range of motion that can upset the internal homeostasis uh, of the tendon. Another example of abnormal tensile loading involves unaccustomed loading that is either uh, rapid or repetitive and within the mid-range uh, of the range of motion of the joint involved. So it doesn't have to involve end range strain, but simply involving either rapid or repetitive uh, loading, particularly loading that's unaccustomed. And you're going to hear this uh, in your examinees. They'll tell you stories that uh, they uh, were changed from their routine uh, position at their job place and they were placed into a new position uh, 
and they were required to do a high volume of work because uh, some other coworker uh, was absent or there was some um, uh, consolidation of duties, etc. And they're involved with a new level of loading that is unaccustomed, but that is repetitive. And this is the type of thing that causes a disruption uh, within the internal environment of the tendon and causes the tendon to become painful and ultimately causes it to become degenerative, okay? And then there are also abnormal compression loading and abnormal shearing loading. With abnormal compression loading, this is the most common type of abnormal loading that we're gonna see in shoulder pain cases, uh, particularly those examinees who, whose workplace duties involve arm flexion or arm abduction between the range of 60 and 90 degrees of elevation. In this particular range of motion of the humerus bone, meaning 60 to 120 degrees of abduction or flexion, these tendons here, these rotator cuff tendons become compressed against two structures. They become compressed underneath the acromion process of the scapula here. And you can see the proximity of the supraspinatus tendon here to the undersurface of the acromion process here. And then also they become compressed underneath the coracoacromial ligament around here in the front uh, of the shoulder. So as the arm goes through 60 to 120 degrees of elevation, the supraspinatus tendon, which is then simultaneously under tensile load, it's under tensile load as it sustains the weight of the arm here on uh, the structure of the tendon. Not to mention if there's something in the hand or if there's some lifting or exertion going on out here at the end of the arm, uh, all of that is borne by the tendons here at the shoulder joint. Well, between 60 and 120 degrees of elevation, these tendons become, in addition to loaded tensilely, tensilely, they become loaded compressively underneath these structures of the acromion of the scapula and the coracoacromial ligament around in the front. So this loading, this repetitive loading, is a lot like taking uh, is a lot like taking a piece of dental floss between your teeth and shearing it back and forth and pulling on that dental floss against the side of your tooth and scraping that dental floss. Imagine the strain on that piece of dental floss. That's exactly what's taking place uh, at these tendons, at these compressive sites, sites, excuse me. Now in the shoulder, this is particularly a problem because of the narrow spaces here where the tendons wrap around the bone and especially in these narrow areas, which are often associated with reduced blood flow. And so these avascular areas of the tendon become quickly degenerative if this abnormal loading situation cannot be uh, alleviated and or rectified. And then in addition to tensile loading and compressive loading, we finally uh, see abnormal loading in the form of shearing forces. And shearing forces Finally, shearing forces occur at points of friction where the tendon interfaces with other soft tissues or even between the tendon's fascicles themselves. And all three of these abnormal types of loading, tensile loading, compression loading, and shearing forces, uh, shearing loading, excessive shearing loading, upset the internal homeostasis of the tendon, which results in a decay uh, of the health of the tendon. So here with regards to the shoulder, we have a diagram that shows an examinee doing work at 60 to uh, 120 degrees of arm elevation here. And it shows in this diagram, just a picture of the supraspinatus tendon here. And the supraspinatus tendon, in addition to being uh, under tensile load in this direction, okay, I won't draw over the tendon itself, but imagine the ten tensile loading uh, of the tendon along the direction of its fibers in this direction here. In addition to the tensile loading, it's under compressive loading underneath the acromion process of the scapula and then also underneath the coracoacromial ligament here. Uh, 
And these are, in addition to compressive areas, these are areas of friction due, due to the narrow passageways here. And then if we couple the third type of abnormal load uh, into this tendon, you can imagine that within these tendon fascicles themselves, as these uh, tendon fascicles pass through these compressed areas, there's disproportionate and uh, differential gliding and sliding of the fascicles uh, within the internal structure of the tendon itself. And this uh, creates the final straw that breaks the camel's back of the tendon in the form of shearing forces. So all three of these forces, either alone or in combination, and especially at the shoulder in combination, can result in shoulder tendon pain and shoulder tendon degeneration. Okay, so when you have an examinee who has shoulder pain and who has suffered an industrial shoulder injury and who has gone through conservative and or surgical treatment of the shoulder and comes to you at the permanent and stationary evaluation, what are the permanent impairment options that you have available to you to accurately rate this examinee for their loss of function of the shoulder joint? Well, by review of chapter 16, there are a small population of physical examination findings for which, for which the examinee will qualify for a permanent impairment rating. So let's review those uh, here briefly. So one of the impairments uh, that the examinee could qualify for is arthroplasty. If the examinee has had a surgical procedure, such as a resection of the distal clavicle, this is specifically described in the AMA guides as qualifying for permanent impairment. So your examinee, if they've had surgery, specifically a resection of the distal clavicle or even any other surgical procedure by analogy, by analogy, you can provide for a permanent impairment rating due to arthroplasty. Another impairment that applies to the shoulder is decrease or losses of range of motion. And there are six ranges of motion for which we assess our examinee. Similarly, there's six ranges of motion uh, through which we assess the examinee's shoulder strength to resisted manual muscle testing, again in six ranges of motion. And if the examinee comes up uh, with loss of strength in one or more of those ranges of motion, that could qualify the examinee for a permanent impairment rating. And then finally, uh, shoulder instability, or I shouldn't say finally, because I do have another finally. Number four is shoulder instability. Shoulder instability. If the examinee has any finding for subluxation and or repetitive recurring dislocation of the shoulder, this would qualify for uh, a permanent impairment rating as well. And as this relates to your tendinopathy cases, remember that tendons cross the joint and tendons provide structural stability to the joint and the tone of the muscles that attach these tendons to the bone uh, contribute to stability of joints, especially in the shoulder. So if there's a tendinopathy condition and damage and inhibition to the muscles that uh, uh, ordinarily uh, retain taut these tendons, that could result in shoulder instability finding for which the examinee may qualify for a permanent impairment rating. So these are the three that you're gonna use most often here, decreased range of motion, decreased strength and instability. And I wanna just say a note about uh, shoulder instability. Many qualified medical evaluators have a mediocre or poor shoulder stability examination. And the reason for that is in our clinical practice, we don't often or we don't well assess our clinical patients for the presence or absence of shoulder instability. In our clinical practice, we're much more concerned with other diagnosable conditions of the shoulder, such as shoulder impingement syndrome and biceps tendonitis and subacromial bursitis and acromioclavicular separation and all these clinical conditions that have no relevance in the permanent impairment evaluation, except to the extent that they affect range of motion, to the extent that they affect strength, and to the extent that they affect the stability of the shoulder.
So I'm asking you to master the shoulder stability examination. And even though you don't routinely employ this in your clinical practice, I'm asking that you become expert in assessing for subtle and profound losses of shoulder stability because it's one of the major impairments for which the examinee could qualify and for which they rightly may qualify for in shoulder tendinopathy conditions. And then finally, uh, a little used impairment of the shoulder that uh, you may occasionally encounter has to do with uh, nerve injury, nervous injury, neurologic injury to the structures in and around the shoulder. And for example, I recently had an examinee who had a winged scapula and the winged scapula affected the function of the shoulder and that was due to a neurologic condition versus due to an orthopedic condition within the shoulder tendons themselves, for example. Now, uh, with regards to combining these impairments, we cannot combine decreased strength with decreased stability of the shoulder, but we can combine decreased range of motion with shoulder instability. We can combine decreased range of motion with decreased strength and decreased stability. We can combine, uh, I'm sorry, we can combine arthroplasty with decreased range of motion and decreased strength. And we can also combine decreased range of motion with decreased strength and uh, loss of shoulder stability. So therefore, loss of range of motion can be universally combined with all of the other impairments. And this is the group from which your examinee is most likely going to derive their permanent impairment rating. Now with regard to permanent impairment of the shoulder due to arthroplasty, this permanent impairment uh, is specifically described in the AMA guides as involving a resection of the distal clavicle. So you might ask yourself, why is it that the AMA guides provide for a permanent impairment rating due to resection of the distal clavicle? What is it about a resection of the distal clavicle that causes a loss of function of the shoulder? Well, opinions on this vary and many qualified medical evaluators feel uh, that when the examinee has any kind of a surgical procedure to the shoulder, even those surgical procedures that do not involve a resection of the distal clavicle, they will provide for a permanent impairment rating by analogy to resection of the distal clavicle, by analogy to arthroplasty. Now, in my opinion, this analogy must be very well explained because a resection of the distal clavicle creates a unique impairment that other surgical procedures may not create. A resection of the distal clavicle causes a loss of support for the neurovascular structures that pass uh, under the first rib and over the clavicle, such as the subclavian artery, the subclavian vein, and the brachial plexus. So this is a unique impairment not shared with other shoulder surgical procedures. In other words, shoulder surgical procedures can create impairment in the form of decreased range of motion, decreased strength, and shoulder instability, as can a resection of the distal clavicle but the AMA guides, the authors of the AMA guides in their infinite wisdom provide for a specific and unique impairment for resection of the distal clavicle because of this loss of support for the neurovascular structures, which is not an impairment that we see in some of these other <coughs> shoulder surgical procedures, such as an arthroscopic Mumford, such as a biceps tenodesis, such as an open reduction internal fixation, uh, injury of the shoulder that involve fracture of the shoulder, one or more of the bones of the shoulder. Uh, subacromial decompression uh, does not involve loss of support for the neurovascular structures, resection of the coracochromial ligament, arthroscopic debridement, or glenoid labrum repair. These are some of the surgical procedures that we're going to encounter in our examinees. And uh, if you so feel you can provide for a permanent impairment rating for these conditions by analogy, by analogy to arthroplasty. And many qualified medical evaluators do this. They do this.
my opinion, uh, your explanation for this uh, had better be good because uh, and a, a resection of the distal clavicle is a unique impairment not shared by these surgical procedures, but I'm well aware that uh, this analogy is often made and it's often upheld uh, by the parties, okay? So to finish today's program, let's just uh, review a couple of these uh, surgical procedures so you have an idea what it is that you're evaluating when you encounter uh, these examinees. Okay, so here on the left, we have an example of a resection of the distal clavicle. So here is the distal clavicle, and you can see that that has been removed, a significant portion has been removed from the acromioclavicular articulation. Typically, uh, just around one centimeter is removed. This, uh, this appears to be a large uh, resection. And you'll notice as a concomitant or associated finding, we have a high riding of the humeral head within the glenoid cavity, uh, perhaps suggestive of dysfunction uh, of the rotator cuff <clears throat> to be able to depress the head of the humerus within the glenoid cavity. So these uh, would be some uh, clinical findings that would consist that would be consistent with an ongoing rotator cuff tendinopathy condition. Here on the right, we have an example of a biceps tenodesis procedure typically performed in the case of a uh, slap lesion of the superior glenoid labrum here. Many times in order to uh, correct for that condition, this portion of the biceps tendon is removed. This uh, decayed and degenerative portion, this thickened, uh, painful portion of the biceps tendon is removed and the biceps tendon is reattached uh, down here outside of, outside of the joint so that the tendon no longer crosses the joint here, but then uh, is restricted to only crossing one joint down at the elbow. So this relieves the bicep tendon up at the shoulder joint, relieves the tendinopathy condition here, and many times uh, can relieve the glenoid labrum uh, involvement as well. With an arthroscopic acromioplasty procedure, the undersurface of the acromion process here is uh, recontoured and reshaped and reconfigured, typically to remove osteophytes due to chronic irritation of the supraspinatus tendon as it becomes uh, repetitively compressed against the undersurface of the acromion. Also in uh, cases where the acromion has a downward slope to it, such as uh, the classic type 3 acromion, an arthroscopic acromioplasty can open up this osseous outlet here to allow for more uh, functional space for the supraspinatus tendon uh, within which to be able to operate. Similarly, with a thickened coracoacromial ligament, here's the coracoacromial ligament uh, passing between the coracoid process of the scapula to the acromion process of the scapula. And you'll notice that the coracoacromial ligament is a ligament that uh, attaches bone to bone, as, as all ligaments do, but the coracoacromial ligament is unique in that it attaches a process to another process of the same bone. In other words, the coracoid process is on the scapula, the acromion process is on the scapula. So this is a classical joint stabilizing ligament per se, but it's, a, it's an overhead roof protective ligament that uh, covers the supraspinatus tendon as the supraspinatus tendon passes through the supraspinatus fossa here. And this can be a source of compression and friction for the supraspinatus tendon as it attaches out here to the greater tubercle of the humerus bone. So with a resection of the coracoacromial ligament, it lifts that roof off, lifts that roof off from above the supraspinatus tendon and allows, again, like arthroscopic acromioplasty, allows for more functional space for the supraspinatus tendon.
So doctors, I hope this helps you. With the shoulder, we have five possible options uh, under the strict application of the AMA guides for providing for a permanent impairment rating for examinees who present with rotator cuff tendinopathy or any other type of shoulder tendinopathy. These are conditions that likely, uh, at least given uh, the same ongoing type of work, in other words, no work restrictions that remove the examinee from the same type of heavy and repetitive work, these are conditions that likely will never recover to pre-injury condition because of the degenerative nature of tendons themselves. Once the internal environment and homeostasis has been disrupt disrupted, it's extremely difficult to restore homeostasis and to restore anabolism to the tendon to the degree that the tendon rebuilds itself and fortifies itself back to a pre-injury condition. So these are examinees who likely uh, will qualify for permanent impairment and there's five options that are available to you. <clears throat> there's decreased range of motion, decreased strength, shoulder instability, neurologic involvement of the shoulder such as a drooping shoulder or such as a winged scapula, okay? And then finally, in those cases where the examinee has had a surgical procedure, specifically a resection of the distal clavicle, this is described under the strict application of the AMA guides. Now, many other qualified medical evaluators will tell you, and they tell me, <laughs> that they will provide for a permanent impairment rating by analogy to resection of the distal clavicle for any shoulder uh, surgical procedure. So the permanent impairment rating for the shoulder surgical procedure would be the primary impairment. And then the examinee would qualify for additional impairments uh, due to decreased range of motion, decreased strength, or, or any instability that the shoulder then may be left with. Now, if you're gonna provide for a permanent impairment rating by analogy to resection of the distal clavicle, your explanation had better be pretty good because the impairment for a resection of the distal clavicle is unique and is not shared by any of the other shoulder surgical procedures. However, all shoulder surgical procedures have a few things in common in that they involve a penetration of the joint, they involve a surgical opening and surgical closing uh, and a surgical wound, and they involve all involve some uh, manipulation of the internal uh, anatomy of the shoulder joint. So they share those features in common. And for that reason, uh, many qualified medical evaluators feel that any shoulder surgical procedure, whether the procedure was successful or not, qualifies at least for 6% whole person impairment rating by resection of the distal clavicle. And you may feel similarly. So doctors, I hope this helps you. You know, you're gonna be seeing uh, shoulder pain cases in a large percentage of your uh, permanent impairment evaluations. And I venture to say that the percentage is extremely high, somewhere in the range of 75 to 80 to 85 and even 90% of cases will involve some type of an upper extremity component. And of those cases that involve an upper extremity component, the most common of which is gonna be the shoulder <laughs> because of the unique weak nature of the shoulder joint you're going to be seeing many many shoulder pain cases and these are just some ideas as to how you can evaluate and how you can rate these examinees conditions so i want to thank you for taking the time to join me on this discussion related to rotator cuff tendinopathy in our next session we're going to explore some spinal impairments having to do with spinal anomalies and also the impact of those spinal anomalies on the integrity of the motion segments and the movements of the motion segments of the spine. So look forward to being with you on our next session. And for now, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter wishing you best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.